The recording that I have right now shows only four student participants as there are, no, four student cameras as there are only four, five now. Ah, these people want to be seen in, the, in my video, in my YouTube channel. That's why they have turned their cameras on. Uh, as an update, people, I now have 252 subscribers. It's rising. I, I don't know what's going on. Last night, I found that it was at 252. On Sunday, I know, yesterday morning, I checked. I don't know why I also kept on checking. Yesterday morning, I found that it was at 245. I had 245 subscribers in the morning. Last night when I checked on it, I had suddenly 252. I don't know where those seven, yeah, those, where those seven minions have come from. But suddenly seven others decided to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want, uh, let's spread the love. <laughs> and then eventually I'll reach that 1,000 minimum subscribers. And then I'll reach the minimum number of watching hours. The road to monetization. Just so you'll know, people, I have a video. Your, your video from last year, August 25, 2000, that video has reached 10,000 views already. And I don't know how in the world it has reached that number. Imagine 10,000 views. Like every time I look at that video now, I could see a 10 and a K. So how do you want me to read that? That's 10,000. Let's keep them coming, people. Let's keep them coming. Let's keep the, the, the fervor burning for video recording. Lesson six, we are down to our sixth lesson for the first quarter. As the first quarter comes to a close, more or less, we'll have only eight. So we are now coming to, up to almost the end of the first quarter. And for this discussion, we shall have a variety of ways to create or construct sentences. Of course, if we recall our knowledge on how we create sentences, we are reminded that per requirement, there should be a subject and a verb. It should be a group of words. Well, interjections may also be classified as sentences. But basically, sentences should be a group of words with a subject and a verb and that the thought is complete. Once all of these three requirements have been met, we have what we can call a sentence. And going into the subject-verb component, the typical format or the, the typical arrangement is that the subject comes first. That's how we are typically introduced to the concept of making sentences. The subject comes first, and then the verb comes next. In that sense, we have a sentence in the natural order. The natural order of sentences would tell us that what we should see first is a subject and then the verb comes next. For example, how, uh, here, how the man held his breath that long is quite a mystery. Our subject here, take note, is no single word subject. We have a subject expressed in the form of a clause. If we go back to our first lesson, nouns in different structures, we have here a noun clause, which we have made as a subject of the sentence. What is that noun clause? Our noun clause, which our noun clause is how the man held his breath that long. In this sentence, it functions as the subject. And obviously, it's what we could see first. It's what introduces us or it's what begins our sentence. The word that comes after it is the word is, which is a verb. And so, the order of words in that sentence would show us that the subject comes first and it is followed by the verb. Thus, the natural order. Subject, then verb. 
And again, I mentioned it earlier, that's the typical arrangement of words that we are introduced to when it comes to making sentences. The many sentences that we create are in that format. Yet, we are reminded of the label or the title for module 6 or lesson 6 that we are talking of sentence variations, which means that even if this is the typical structure of having sentences, we could come up with several other ways. The first that we are introduced into sentence variation is the concept of having an inverted order, or sometimes we call it the inverted sentence. The inverted order of words in a sentence or the inverted sentence would tell us that we are not going to see the subject first. What we should have instead is the verb. And then it's going to be followed by the subject. The concept of inversion. In the natural order, subject comes first, then the verb. In the inverted order, the verb comes first, then the subject. A, a common example for words or sentences expressed in the inverted order are your interrogative sentences. Interrogative sentences are questions, and questions begin with either a question word or a question verb. If it's a question word, what... If we, if we think of question words, they are your interrogative pronouns. Like who, what, when, where. And basically you ask them because they are information questions. You are using them to begin an information question. For example, example you have how? How is this possible? In that sentence, the question word how is what introduces, sorry, the interrogative pronoun how is what introduces or starts the question. What comes after the interrogative pronoun is the verb is, not the subject yet. We are plainly looking at what words come after the other. Have, no, how is the first word? Obviously, it's not the subject, nor is it the verb. Then we are, the word how is followed by the word is, which is a verb. The word is is followed by the demonstrative pronoun this. The demonstrative pronoun this functions as the subject of that sentence. So true enough, what we could see is is and followed by this. Is is the verb and this is the subject. Therefore, a sentence in the inverted order. What about affirmation questions or those yes, no questions? Yes, no questions do not begin with question, wor question words or interrogative pronouns. Yes, no questions begin with question verbs. Helping verbs that had been used to introduce or start a question. And so they become question verbs. For example, Do you like that pie? We don't have any interrogative pronoun here. However, we still have a word that has been used to begin a question, and it happens to be in the form of a verb. This verb then that does not just function as a helping verb, it takes on a different role in the context of the statement. It begins a question, it now becomes a question verb. So we have do. And what comes after do? We have the pronoun you, which happens to be the subject of the sentence. Still, we have a verb followed by a subject. The verb came first as the, as the subject came next. A sentence again in the inverted order. Questions? Another case is when we use expletives. 
expletives like the words there and here. When here and there are used to start a sentence and that immediately these sentences are followed by the verb, the sentence is in the inverted order. Please take note of that condition. If the expletive is followed immediately by the verb, that sentence is in the inverted order. For example, here. There. Here is my letter of resignation. We could see the word here, and it is followed immediately by the word is. And so we consider this automatically as a sentence in the inverted order. Another proof is. Right after the word is, is the subject of the sentence. Letter. The subject of the sentence is the word letter. So you have is plus letter. That is verb plus subject. Again, another sentence in the inverted order. Let's, let's try using there. There are two students in the lobby. There being the expletive is right away followed by the verb are. And then what comes after are is the subject students. Two is a modifier to students. So let me focus on the word students. So what you have is are followed by students. And by formula, that means you have a subject first followed by the verb. Earlier, I said that here and there becomes part of an inverted sentence only when they are immediately followed by a verb. Why? Because, of course, there's that possibility that what comes after here and there are not verbs at all. And that would put the sentence back in the natural order. For example, I'll try to set that, put a separator. Huh? I am looking. I'm not sure how. Uh, I forgot who is that there. Here my dreams have been buried. Here introduces the sentence. Just like sentence A. The first word that we could see here is the word here. But look at the word that comes after the word here. Is it a verb? It's not. In this sentence, the words are not in the inverted order. Why? The word that comes after here is the subject of the sentence. Dreams acts, the word dreams acts as the subject, followed by have been buried, which is our verb. That is subject plus verb. This order is the natural order of words in a sentence. So, sir, how the, what is then the function of here in sentence letter C? In sentence letter C, here does not anymore function as an expletive. Here acts as a demonstrative adverb, not an expletive. The same goes with there. That's why earlier I really pointed out once here and there are immediately followed by verbs, they become expletives and automatically the sentence is in the, in the inverted order of words. Let's have sentence D for the word there. To find the dominant the let's focus ourselves to the and to the There. There you can see the students in their new uniform. 
in the sentence, our subject is you. Our verb is can see. And look at the placement, look at the arrangement of the words in that sentence. You comes first. Can see the verb came next to sub to the subject you. The word that comes immediately after there, the first the first word there, T H E R E, is the subject. Therefore, the sentence is in the natural order. There is not an expletive, it functions as a demonstrative adverb. Questions regarding the natural order and inverted order so far? Any question? So we are done with interrogative sentences. We are done with expletives. We, of course, have a third option, and that has something to do with phrases. Sorry. Phrases can be used. There, yes, Kim, you have an X. Oh, sorry. Uh, phrases can be used in the inverted order of sentences. This may not be the typical way to use phrases, but this is again giving us an idea that for the sake of variety, we can use phrases to start a sentence. But look at what again is the important condition. The phrase has to be immediately followed by the verb. If what comes after that phrase is not a verb, then the sentence is not in the inverted order. Again, if what comes immediately after that phrase is not a verb, then the sentence is not in the inverted order. For example, uh, sentence A. Such that X is an element of lying on the floor are my dogs and hamsters. What we could see first in this sentence is actually a present participial phrase. Present because you have the word lying. Lying is the ing form of lie, which means that it's a present participle expressed in the phrase in phrase form. It is a present participial phrase, a phrase indeed. And then what comes after? Our present participial phrase, you have the verb are. The verb are is immediately placed after the phrase, and the verb are is followed by the compound subjects of the sentence. The subjects are dogs and hamsters, which means that in the sentence, are appears first, followed by dogs and Hamsters. Basically, that's the verb followed by the subject, which means the sentence is in the inverted order. Take note, this is a present participial phrase. And there is another phrase available out there. You could also have a past participial phrase or even a prepositional phrase. There's even an infinitive phrase. Regardless what we need to consider as a condition is after these phrases immediately should be a verb. And take note, those phrases cannot function, must not function as the subject. So what kind of phrase am I also referring to? The phrase I'm talking about, because we're dealing with phrases here, take note, they should be modifying phrases. They are capable of modification Phrases that do not function as nouns. Let's try to have a prepositional phrase. Or X is an element of all real numbers such that X is not equal to 3. Or you can have it in words. This worded expression is just the same as that. 
Symbol expression of the first uh, in the solution. In the cabin or is the old lawn mower. Our first group of words in this sentence is the phrase in the cabin. In fact, you can revise this later on and put the sentence in the natural order. You can do the same to sentence A. The old lawn mower is in the cabin. My dogs and hamsters are lying on the floor. We can put them back in the natural order. Anyway, this is just a mere rearrangement of the placement of the subject and the verb. Because again, that's what makes it in the natural order or in the inverted order. For sentence letter B, the subject is lawn mower or mower. The verb is is. Just mower. Which means that what we could see first is the verb followed by the subject. That's again our target. That's the simple goal. What is our verb? What is the subject? Locate the subject. Locate the verb. Just because the phrase contains a noun doesn't mean that that noun is the subject. Take note in a phrase, its receiver is not a subject. In sentence A for group three, the word floor is not a subject. It is a noun, but it's not the subject. In sentence B, cabin is a noun, but it's not the subject. Both are receivers, objects in function, not subjects. Always ask yourself when you see something like that, especially when it comes to your ST. What is the subject here? What is the verb? Which comes first? Oh, the subject came first. Automatically, it's in the natural order. Oh, in this one, the verb came first. This is in the inverted order. Questions regarding the inverted and natural order of words in a sentence. Questions. If there's none, allow me to proceed. Aside from looking at the arrangement or placement of the subject and the verb in a sentence, another way of having a another way of having variations in our sentences is by doing special openers. Special openers are those that we use to begin a sentence, but the sentence most probably remains its being in the natural order. Yes. Most probably, it stays to be in the natural order. Yet, the subject is what not appears first. Again, the natural order is kept, but we won't see the subject first. For example, you have, if you could still see the sentence for letter number two, expletives, and then you go for sentences C and D. If you go to those two sentences, the one which says, the first one which says, here my dreams have been buried. My dreams or dreams as the subject, that's not the first thing that you could see. But the demonstrative adverb here. For sentence two, for sentence B there, you can see the students in their new uniform. You is the subject, but it's not the first word that we could see in the sentence. Rather, it's the word there. So this tells us that this tells us that we can definitely use expressions to open our sentence or begin our sentence aside from the subject. To start, we are told that we could have single word special openers. From the word itself, we are going to use single word expressions to open a sentence. First option, of course, you have your adverbs. And then two of them were given earlier. You can have demonstrative adverbs. In the use of demonstrative adverbs, sorry. 
in the use of demonstrative adverbs, a comma is not necessary. A comma is not necessary to separate the special opener from the rest of the words in the sentence. That's also quite a rule when it comes to special openers. Please take note of this. As we use special openers in a sentence, on a gen general note, a comma is required. On a general note, a comma is used to separate the special opener from the rest of the words in the sentence. When I say rest of the words, from the independent clause. So we have here, oh, I think it's better to look at it that way. We should have, oh wait, special opener, opener, comma, independent clause. That's our formula here as we're using a special opener. Special opener, comma, independent clause. Because the independent clause just follows the natural order, most probably the natural order. But when it comes to demonstrative adverbs, the comma is not a prerequisite. It's not a really a requirement. That's quite the exemption. For example, uh, a... Uh, and I believe you know what's next. It's called that. Divide both sides by x minus 1. So we have here y, but it's x minus 1. Like this. Divide x minus 1. There he is. 3x. The demonstrative pronoun appears first. x. Not the word he, but he is the subject. And he is followed by the verb, which is is. And then the sentence remains to be in the natural order. It just begins with the word there. In fact, if you state it as he is there, there he is and he is there mean actually the same thing. It's just that by virtue of sentence variation, we opted to make the sentence start with the word there. And still, the sentence remains to be grammatically acceptable. And a comma is not a requirement. Questions regarding the use of demonstrative adverbs. Another adverb can actually be used. Your adverbs of manner. How do we... We've had the lessons on adverbs. Adverbs of manner. Verb modification. How do we... Cons what's the typical structure of an adverb of manner? We have an adjective and we added an ly. That's the typical structure. But adverbs of manner are not limited to that structure. We have words like Quickly, from the word quick, added with an L-Y, it becomes an adverb of manner. And once you have an adverb of manner used in a sentence, now the general, general rule applies. That adverb of manner is set off from the independent clause using a comma. For example, let me use quickly. Uh, this is sentence B.1. And this is our answer. Quickly. Will be highlighted. Okay. We find the domain Quickly, the, the students function. left the, the school. The our subject in the sentence is the word students. The verb is left. However, students being the subject, that's not the first word or first thing that we could see in the sentence. It's rather the adverb of manner. So to find the domain, another one. Find the restriction and um. have your conditions met by the algorithm, and then after that, ah, okay. so for the inverse function, find the domain of the inverse function, which will serve as the base of your original function. Wait, sorry. Uh, example number two. Uh, 
wisely that te the, te the teacher spent his time checking test papers. The subject of the sentence is the word teacher. The verb is spent. And then the word though that we would see first is the word wisely. Taken from the word wise, which is an adjective, added with an L-Y, it transforms into an adverb. Now it becomes an adverb of manner. And again, look at what sets off, what separates that adverb, adverb of manner from the rest of the words found in the independent clause. You have a comma. Questions regarding the use of adverbs of manner. Another one. Another category. Adverbs of time. Yes, adverbs of time can also be used to especially open a sentence. For example, see, see that one. This quadratic expression will lead us to uh, domain and arrange still. No quadratic. Yesterday, my friends and I went to our teacher's house. The subject, we have a common subject. You have friends and I. Verb, went. However, the subject is not what we could see first. What It's not what we could find first in the sentence. We are rather introduced to the word yesterday. It's the first one that we could see and it is an adverb of time. This should tell you that adverbs can definitely be used to open sentences. You could even have an adverb of frequency. Adverbs of frequency. For example, sometimes sometimes the students submit their works late but I think it's not sometimes but it's always to a number of students again an adverb of frequency but adverbs are not the only single word special openers that we can use we are told that we could have verbals. We are told that we can have verbals. We can also have verbals as single word special openers. However, can we use a gerund as a single word special opener? We cannot. A gerund is a noun. Special openers of this case, we are referring to them as modifiers. As nouns, as if you want to use a gerund to open your sentence, you will not have a special opener there. Because if the gerund appears first, most probably, it is, not just most probably, if the gerund appears first, then it is the subject of that sentence. No special opener. But, uh, and that's the reason why, why we will set aside the gerund for now. We will focus on verbals, single word verbals, which could be the infinitive and your participles, the present participle or the past participle. Let's start with the infinitive. Sir, you're talking of single word expressions. Aren't infinitives composed of two words? When we look at an infinitive, yes, the preposition to is there and the base verb is also there. However, these two are taken as a single semantic unit. One unit that provides or yeah, one unit that provides a complete meaning of a particular expression. That's what a semantic unit is. So the infinitive is not taken as two separate words, but they are taken as one as two words combined into creating one semantic unit. Thus, it still counts as a single word expression. For example, let's say that 
minus y minus to x. succeed. Then after that, to succeed, we need to strive hard. Apply. There is an infinitive in the sentence which opens the sentence. The subject is we. The verb is need. And we is not the first thing that we could see in the sentence. It's rather to succeed. And if you look at the structure of to succeed, it's to plus the base form of succeed, which is also succeed. Thus, we have an infinitive. Minus x y minus y is equal to six x minus one. Before proceed, can we uh, ask a question if you're confused? And let's apply completing the square. So to complete the square class, we have to first look at our terms which are constant and linear, and also to survive. Sure, a person must do what he can in the while. The subject in the sentence is person. Verb must do. Yet, the subject is not what appears first in the sentence. It's rather the infinitive to survive. And once again, we are reminded of the general rule. We will set our single word special opener Free or off, we will set it off from the independent clause using a comma. Let's do the second verbal, single word verbal that we can use. You have your past participle. Let's remind ourselves past participles could come in two types. It could be a regular past participle or an irregular past participle. Regular past participles are formed by adding a D or an ED to the base verb. Irregular past participles undergo two possible changes. No, two possible scenarios. The first one is that past participle went through a change in spelling. And the second one is the past participle did not have any change in spelling at all. For example, let's start with a regular past participle. Your coefficient or factor the linear term. What's a regular path? What are you? Or simply guess the coefficient of your linear term by factoring variable y. I'm thinking of a regular past participle, which one would make sense. Plus one over ah, here. x above. One plus one over x. Baked. So the cake in the oven looks perfect. A participle is indeed a modifier, and in this sentence, it's modifying the, the word baked is modifying the word cake. What kind of cake is it that looks perfect in the oven? It's the one that is baked. And the sentence contains the subject cake. Yet the word cake is not what appears first. Rather, it's the word baked. I'll have... An irregular past participle now that has undergone a change in spelling. Okay. What is the coefficient of your linear term? Plus one over x plus stolen. My new wallet contains all of my money. Stolen is the past participle form of the verb steal. It's steal, stole, stolen. And look at what we are doing here. The word stolen is the first thing that appears first, even if the subject is wallet. The, wor the word wallet, the subject wallet, is not the first thing that you would see in the sentence. The opener is the word stolen. The third possible kind, or the uh, let's have the second irregular past participle, second in the sense that there's going to be no change in the spelling of the word.
Cut. All of the papers have been spread on the floor. Cut remains to be cut. It's cut in the base form, cut in the simple past form, and cut still in the same spelling for the past participle form. So this is the third, uh, the second irregular form of a past participle. Subject, it's all. Verb, have been spread. The word all is not the first thing that we, should, we could see in this sentence. Rather, it is the word cut, which is a past participle. Questions regarding, part, regarding verbals as single word verbals as special openers. If there's none, let me proceed to the third category of the single word expressions. You have transition markers or transition words. Transition markers or transition words. Some of them we've known as conjunctive adverbs. But this time, we will not just make use of them as conjunctive adverbs. Uh, an adverb becomes a conjunctive adverb if it's used to connect two independent clauses. The adverb here that we are using, which is a transition marker, will be used to begin an entirely different sentence. For example, uh, this is C. That one. All over 2x. The square root of this. However, the results were not that good. The subject of the sentence is the word results. The verb is the word where. But the word results is not the first thing that we would see in the sentence. Rather, it's the word however. A transition marker that tells us of an opposing consequence. A contradictory result in relation to a prior sentence. So in the context of sentence C.1, this is in the assumption that there's already a prior sentence. Something has already been previously stated. Yet, we did not combine the previous statement to the other, to this one, independent clause. We did not create just one single sentence. We opted to have an entirely different sentence. Thus, however, it's not just, it's not anymore a conjunctive adverb. It is a transition marker. Remember our lessons on conjunctive adverbs? Conjunctive adverbs are used to combine independent clauses. In effect, we are creating just one sentence. Here, however, is not a conjunctive adverb. Here's what I mean. Uh, let me call it sentence C.1.1. <laughs> what a code. Cool. So the inverse of function G. See, that's what I meant. The research has been completed. However, the results were not that good. In this sentence, in C.1.1, C.1.1, however, is used as a conjunctive adverb. In this sentence, we don't have a special opener. We didn't make use of however as a special opener. Why? Because the sentence begins with the subject, which is research. That is why we went with sentence C.1. Sentence C.1 tells us that however, or shows to us that however is the first word that we could find in the sentence. Thereby, a transition marker acting as a special opener. You don't need to continue the solution. Any questions so far? By the time you simplify the By the way, it's already 8.32. We'll just continue this discussion this afternoon at 4.30 to 5. So that by Friday, by Thursday, hopefully, we will not anymore have to cover more time for the discussions as there are plenty of items to check.
That will be all for this morning. Grade 10, goodbye and thank you. Goodbye and thank you, sir. Goodbye and thank you, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye.